If you've watched any of my DIY smart home series, you'll know I'm somewhat almost, uh, I suppose, militant with my approach to smart devices. I don't do cloud hosted stuff. If it doesn't work without an internet connection permanently, then I'm not interested. Although, sadly, I think that I'm uh, very much in the minority, as smart Internet of Things devices with permanent internet access are becoming increasingly common in everyone's households. To me, that's a pretty massive problem, although it's one that I think fairly few seem to, well, understand all that much, so let me explain my, my thinking and some examples, and hopefully what we can kind of well, do about it. There are a few key sort of problems with all of these internet dependent devices, from products being bricked or abandoned to having your home, well, just cooking you alive because someone remotely told it to. And also just so much more. Uh, one of the most common problems to find is that thanks to the requirement to be constantly connected to a, a server somewhere, if that server goes down, either from a technical fault or because the company has just pulled support or straight up gone out of business, the device might outright refuse to work at all or at best will just become a featureless or a sort of dumb device, uh, the sort of standard features that the non-smart device version of it may have. To give you some examples of that kind of abandonware, in 2020, Under Armour pulled support for their $400 line of smart fitness trackers, including a $180 set of smart scales. While the scales do continue to function normally, you know, being able to stand on them and see the weights, any data that you have been collecting to show your fitness progress is now gone, as the app that you used to access that data was pulled from app stores and couldn't even be exported. The heart rate monitor and the wrist-worn activity tracker appear to be in a bit of a worse state with little to no functionality without their companion apps. Similarly, in 2019, Best Buy pulled support for their Insignia line of smart devices, some of which weren't too problematic having that support gone, such as an internet-connected fridge. I don't know either. Uh, but for things like you know, the internet-connected security cameras, you're just straight up out of luck. And of course, when Sonos pulls support for a whole bunch of their devices, consigning them to a slow demise into basic speakers, well, that wasn't received all too well. But the company doesn't have to go bust or pull support to wreak havoc. A simple technical difficulty can be a major problem. Every time AWS or Amazon Web Services goes down, it takes down half the internet and a large majority of smart devices along with it. This can be as trivial as your robotic vacuum cleaner not running on their schedules and only being able to be started with a physical button, to your home door lock not letting you into your house. Tesla had a problem late last year when their apps server went down and users reported not being able to unlock their car. Now, to make it clear, that only affected the remote unlock feature via the app and not using your phone via Bluetooth or the backup physical like hotel key card you get for the Teslas these days. Those still worked. But still, having a server go down meaning that you can't unlock your car anyway is pretty dumb. But my absolute favourite example for this kind of issue has to be during the Facebook outage, where uh, when they removed all of their BGP or Border Gateway Protocol routes, meaning none of their servers could be found or contacted, Facebook staff were reported to have been locked out of their own buildings and offices because their smart Internet of Things keycard locks couldn't phone home to Facebook servers. That also meant that the recovery to get their servers back online effectively was sort of slowed because they just couldn't get into the server rooms to re-add those routes. It's, it's, just, it's just hilarious to me. Now, another problem can be that sometimes a company decides to lock 
often existing features behind a subscription paywall. Automakers in particular are some of the main perpetrators of this, with stories like how BMW now charges £160 to enable their automatic high beam headlight feature, something that was just included when on older models like my friend's 2010 530D, as in, the car has all of the hardware and software built in to use that function, but unless you pay the ransom, that feature just won't work. Yet, a single unlock key can enable it. There's talk of requiring an active subscription for things like heated seats, active cruise control, and infotainment features. I mean, BMW themselves trialed billing users, or owners I should say, $80 a year for the privilege of using Apple CarPlay in the car they paid literally tens of thousands for and which was fully capable of doing it but would refuse if you didn't cough up the cash. Unfortunately, my car brand of choice, Audi, don't seem to be much better, as a Danish Q4 e-tron owner posted this clip to Reddit showing a pretty basic climate control function. The ability to sync temperatures and fan settings between the two climate zones, left and right, was locked behind a paywall. The hardware button was still included in the car, but pressing it just brings up a message box saying, the function has not been purchased. The function, by the way, is part of the Tri-Zone Climate Control Pack, which costs $758. And similarly, Toyota was in the news recently as their remote engine start function turned out to be locked behind a paywall. And once the three-year trial runs out, the feature just stops working. Even though the feature works with a standard radio frequency key fob, if the car doesn't have an active subscription linked to it, the car will just ignore your key fob input and just not do that function. Your only choice is to pay the protection money or just give up that feature entirely. That's one of the biggest problems with all of this server-controlled kit. You have zero control over the things that you own and use every day. The company can brick it remotely, remove features, or do a mafia-style shakedown for more cash, and you have no choice but either to cough up or give up. Sometimes this is technically an opt-in feature, like Google's Nest Thermostat's Smart Savers Texas program, which, unbeknownst to most anyone who signed up, allowed their local power company to remotely increase their set in home temperature in the middle of the night during a heat wave. You also have dumb things like region locking. Apparently, if you purchase a Hoover brand washer dryer in Europe, you'll have to make sure that you have a European Apple ID handy, because if you don't and say you have a, an American Apple ID because you've, you know, emigrated over, well, their companion app, for which the machine is somewhat wholly designed around, although not exclusively dependent on, won't allow you to sign up or possibly even install it, if I read that correctly, uh, which is, um, well, like I said, pretty dumb. But by far the most egregious offences have to be committed by Tesla. In late 2019, Tesla remotely disabled their autopilot and full self-driving features on a Tesla Model S that was in the process of being sold to a, a new owner. Why did they need to disable that feature? Oh, it's because the new owner, quote, hadn't paid for it. No, the, the feature isn't currently a subscription service. No, it's, it's a one-time fee. Uh, and no, as far as I'm aware, the original owner didn't receive any sort of refund for their non-use for transferring the car. No, Tesla just wants to bill any new owners of those cars again in full. But that's not all. No, as reported widely early last year, Tesla reportedly has the ability to remotely unlock and use the Smart Summon feature without your consent or control. 
The specific case was from a Facebook group post that suggested a repossession agent was both hired and assisted by Tesla in repossessing a Tesla Model 3 from what looked like a shopping plaza car park, specifically without any interaction from the car's registered keeper. Well, the possibly obvious retort to that story is, duh, just make your payments on time, huh? Well, first of all, rather uh, kind of blunt way to look at things. And second of all, the implication that Tesla, without your control or consent, can remotely unlock and functionally drive, especially when self uh, driver driverless self-driving is allowed, you know, they can drive your car, is horrifying. It's not hard to imagine that, well, if you happen to have a grudge with a Tesla employee and happen to drive a Tesla yourself, you could wake up to find your car gone or it's driven itself into your front room. Even just from a theft perspective, that seems like a massive issue that I would be genuinely concerned about if that was a, a very common, easy thing to, to have happen with my car. And speaking of criminal employees, the absolutely insane amount of data each of these devices can report back means that it's trivial to know literally everything about you from a single search of any one of those databases. Everything from knowing where you live, knowing what you've been buying, when you are, or more specifically, I suppose, when you aren't home, and even literally listening to you or watching you at home with your cameras and smart speakers. Amazon in particular did confirm that they do have employees listen to recordings from their Alexa devices, although they were very clear to uh, say that it, they only listen to some randomized, anonymized samples of your commands to help train their voice recognition software, and of course they have very strict controls on that data. But even if that is definitely the case and there is zero abuse at Amazon or any of the other big companies, you can't say that a smaller company would have such systems in place, and even if they did, they still use all of that information for targeted advertising. They literally use it to manipulate you, both into purchasing their products or service, but even as part of political advertisements, which we've seen can have some, well, pretty horrific consequences. And on top of that, those databases then become targets for hackers to extract from. That level of data collection allows for identity theft stupidly easily, or for scammers to much more easily manipulate you, or possibly even worse, impersonate you for everything that they can get. It's also worth noting that these sorts of devices are also targets for hackers to both acquire information and infect other devices on your network, but also many of them use are used as part of a botnet. Many of those smart devices are laughably insecure. So much so that you can use a site like Shodan to search through literally millions of publicly accessible devices, including cameras. Here's a, a multi-camera live feed from a Thai manufacturing plant. Live, unsecured, just on the internet for anyone to view. And on the botnet front, that's used to attack other people's networks in what's called a DDoS or Distributed Denial of Service attack. Basically, the idea is to overwhelm the, uh, the victim's network with so much traffic that they can't operate anymore. Their site is effectively down for any legitimate users because it's so busy serving all of the fake traffic. There are millions of devices as part of botnets worldwide Many of those are Internet of Things devices with unpatched security vulnerabilities. Now, well, there are plenty of other examples and other issues that I, I could mention. I'm not sure that I can handle uh, much more of this sort of dystopian nightmare fuel. So instead, let's talk about what we can do about all this. Well, there aren't any simple answers for sure. The, the most obvious solution is to just not use or buy any of the cloud connected or you know required stuff. But of course, that's easy for, for me to say as a massive tech nerd, uh, because I have the, the knowledge and experience that makes setting up a wholly self-hosted smart home system 
relatively easy. But not everyone's me. Not everyone knows what I know, and for the large majority of people buying that sort of tech, running their own self-hosted solution exclusively would be well outside their comfort zone and a much harder sell than just a, a Bluetooth connected light bulb or whatever else. Now, some data protection laws would also be helpful, although if it's in a company's best interest to capture your data, I'm sure that they'll work out a way to do that regardless. So wherever you can use non-cloud connected devices, whether that's sticking with a, a dumb fridge or toaster or TV, or opting for one with a sort of non-direct internet control, such as the uh, sort of Zigbee devices and Zigbee, especially smart home devices, uh, they can then be run with a self-hosted solution like a Raspberry Pi, something you can check out in my DIY smart home series for a load more information on. Anything like that that you can do to reduce your reliance on external servers and services is better. And for the whole abandonware problem, this Hackaday article introduced me to the idea of source code escrow. Basically, companies would provide their source code for everything from their device firmware to server-side processing, and even potentially hardware designs like PCB files or 3D models, and th those will be held privately and securely until the company either ceases operations or decides to end support for a product at which point that source code would become open source and available to the, the community's update and tweak. That would be especially useful for some devices that just flat out refuse to function without a connection to a server somewhere, where an update should be able to either remove that issue or even let you run a, a, an instance of their server for it locally to make sure that that device keeps working. This sort of solution is unlikely to work on its own, as beyond a, a sort of little selling point that they could list, a company would have relatively little incentive to partake, which is where consumer protection laws requiring companies to use some sort of source code escrow solution uh, would be helpful, so that regardless of that company's fate or the product's fate, the products don't become landfill waste. Of course, in the grand scheme of things, there are likely plenty of other issues that are arguably more important and sort of need solving first, as it were, and a lot of the problems that we face in general are uh, an interconnected web of things, but I still think that it's worth knowing about in at least some amount of detail uh, and having uh, an understanding of things that we could hopefully do to make it just a little bit better, at least for the time being anyway, and I guess just be conscious of it. With that said, uh, you've heard me uh, blabber on enough, so I would love to hear your thoughts on the whole situation in the comments down below. I'd love to hear what you think and uh, have a, a bit of a, a discussion about it. So feel free to, to leave your thoughts in those comments. Um, if you'd like to see more videos, probably less like this. I don't tend to do rant videos, as it were, uh, all that often. But, you know, tech reviews and uh, stuff like the, the DIY Smart Home series, then do feel free to check out the subscribe button and the notification bell. There's also plenty of other videos that will show up in the end cards in a sec. And if you'd like to support me and my uh, ramblings, then you can do so with the YouTube join button and become a YouTube member. You can become a patron if you'd rather instead over on Patreon, or uh, there's plenty of other links in the description for things like hoodies or t-shirts like this one, or a load of other designs I've made myself. There's uh, affiliate links or places like Amazon or Overclock UK. If you're buying from there, feel free to take a look. and. Yeah, that's kind of it really. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, like I said, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below and yeah, we'll see you on the next video.